five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back to Engage 3.0. I am the social media evangelist, Edie Melbourne, and joining me is my co-host, Brother Colin. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. And we are going into our topic, Has Time Been Lost? And we are still in our series, The Sabbath. So our question and answer Bible study today is going to be revolving around the Sabbath. But before we dive any further, we're going to turn it over to Brother Colin. And he's going to lead us into a word of prayer. Brother Garland. Dearly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the word of God that is so encouraging and also uplift our hearts. As we study this word, we ask that you guide our minds and our thoughts, that we be lifted up heavenward, and also help it to inspire us to live for you and to want to live a more full life in our Lord and our Savior. We thank you once again as Brother Helmboring leads us out in this study and myself, but that you be with us, that we not speak our own words, but you guide our lips and the Spirit of the Lord be within our hearts, that we be teaching and inspiring others to want to know the Word of God even more. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you had missed our past broadcast, we took a look at Mark of Apostasy Part 2. So we're going to invite you to click on the link that's going to be left below so you can view those episodes. So everything will tie in and make sense as you watch this particular episode or you listen to it on your favorite podcast station. Okay, so let us move right into our topic for study today. Has time been lost? Many times those concerned about keeping the Bible Sabbath want to know if we can tell where we are in the stream of time. The only way to prove time had been lost would be to locate when and where it was lost. And in that act, we would have found it. So let's look at question number one. Was the weekly cycle lost between the time of Adam and Moses? Let us look at Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 36. We are going to admonish you at this point. Please get your Bibles or your pen and your notepads. Jot down the information as you hear it. Please go back and study and search these things for yourselves. Don't just take what we say here for granted. Please do your homework. And make sure these things, as we say, are so. Um, Brother Colin, lead us into that reading, please. Exodus chapter 16, from verse 1 through 36. It's going to be lengthy, but it's going to be worth it. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 to 36. And it reads, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God he had died, would to God we had died by the hands of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the fresh pot, and when we did eat bread to the full, for he hath brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out to gather a certain weight every day, and I, and I may prove them whether they will walk in my laws 
or no. Mm. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they have bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they have gathered daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even at eve, then ye shall know that the Lord had brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then he shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmuring against the Lord. And what are we that he murmured against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmuring, which he murmured against him, and which, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses speak unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he had heard your murmuring. And it came to pass, as Aaron speak unto the con whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord speak unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, at eve ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall eat, shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at eve the quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round and above the house. And when the dew lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing as small as a hoof forced on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they was not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is bread which the Lord had given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord had commanded, gathered of it every man according to his eating, and homer for every man according to the number of your person, take every man for them which are in the te his tent. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an homer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no, had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. But some of them left off it until the morning, and it breed worm and stink. Moses was wrought with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melt. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two homo for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which is he will break today, and see it that he will see it, and that which we see we made it over laid up for you to be kept until morning. And they laid it up until the morning as Moses bed, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day to for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord had given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the host of Israel called the name of there of manna, and it was like foreign seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafer made with honey. And Moses said, 
This is the thing which the Lord commanded, fill an homo of it to be kept for your generation, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness. When I brought you forth from the land of Egypt, and Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an homo full of manna therein, and lay it up there for the Lord to be kept for your generation. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty days until they came to the land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the border of the land of Canaan. Now, an homo is the tenth part of an ephor. Over the period of 40 years or 280 weeks, God worked four miracles each week in which he pointed out and marked clearly the seventh day Sabbath. One, the manna fell on each of the first five days of the week. Second, any portion kept over one day spoiled. And then on the sixth day, a double portion fell. Thirdly, the unused portion kept over to the seventh day did not spoil. Fourth, on the seventh day, or the Sabbath, no manna fell. And you know, that's a good point. So here you find that uh, Christ, as he led them out, because we know that according to the, uh, uh, the New Testament, that it was Christ that led them um, by the pillar of cloud by day and uh, fire by night. So, and that was Christ that gave them water of the rock. And um, we know that it was Christ or the Lord um, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and training them. This is Exodus chapter 16, which is another good point because it, it's this is way before Mount Sinai because some point out that the law was given at the Jews uh, or to the Jews at Mount Sinai. But we find that the Sabbath that's embedded in the, the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, which relates about the Sabbath, is being taught before they get to the mountain. So that that to me is like tells me that the Sabbath has nothing to do with a Jew or Israel per se being rescued out of Egypt. But it did give us a clue on why this was important. If you go back to Exodus chapter 16, you mentioned it first, and I think it's very, very clear um, for us to understand, or I hope it's clear that we understand who the Sabbath belongs to. It says in verse 23, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord had said, Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Notice it doesn't say for the Jews or because you were taken out of Egypt. It's the Lord's Sabbath. Well, why is that important? If you go to Genesis chapter 2 really quick, it tells us. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. This is what it says. And this is talking about creation. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he, God, rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made verse 3 and god blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested he meaning god from all his work which god created and made and keep in mind that prior to the sabbath in creation that adam and eve was not in existence when god made the sun, the moon, the plants, the trees, the sea animals, the birds, um, when land appeared, when light appeared, he was nowhere to be seen. On the sixth day, man was created. But on the seventh day, they would have been alive to see God make or create the Sabbath. And so they would have had an example in the creator how to keep the Sabbath. They wasn't told how to keep the Sabbath. They saw how to keep the Sabbath because God himself was their example. He's the father, they were his children. 
he was the perfect example. I just love that. And here in Exodus chapter 16, it bears record again that they kept the Sabbath because it belongs to the Lord. Question number two, was the Sabbath laws between the time of Moses and when Jesus lived on earth? Let us look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 reads, He that said that he abided in him or himself also to walk even as he walked. 1 John 2, verse 6. Now let's add Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to couple with that. Okay, let's go to Luke's. We now look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says here, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it reads, And he said unto the Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. The Bible identifies the seventh day Sabbath at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. Let us look at two texts uh, found in Luke's Gospel. We're going to look at Luke chapter 23, verse 52, and then Luke 24, verse 2. Luke chapter 23, verse 52 reads, This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the sepulchre that was hewed in stone, wherein never a man before was laid. And that day was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was drew on. And the woman also which came with him from Galilee followed after her, and beheld the sepulcher, and how the body was laid. And they returned and prepared spice and ointments, and dressed the Sabbath day according to the commandments. It goes on and says in Luke chapter 2, 24 verse 1 and 2 it says now upon the first day of the week very early in the morning they came unto the sepulchre bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them and they found the stone roll away from the sepulchre amen i mean that is clear i don't, I don't know how much more expanding we need on that and the reason why it is so clear is because when we look at the crucifixion the majority of the Christian world understands the crucifixion. They understand the trial that Jesus went through, the mockery of a trial. They understand his crucifixion upon the cross uh, on Friday. And then they understand his burial. And then they understand his resurrection. But this accounts that particular event. And so it gives us um, three dates. The crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. Why that's so important? Well, we identify the crucifixion with Good Friday. That's the day before he was buried. And, the, and as the Bible records in Luke chapter 23, it's the Sabbath. And the day after in Luke chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, it accounts his resurrection as being on the first day of the week. And I just love that. It just tells us just how we in our modern time can follow the Eastern narrative. The Bible plays it out and bears record that it is so that on, on Good Friday or Friday evening or the sixth day of the week, because they weren't given those pagan names. Um, well, they had those names, but the Jews didn't recognize those pagan names, hence why they used the numbers. So on the sixth day or the preparation day, as it was affectionately called by the Jews because of what they would, what they would have known what to do on the sixth day, as we read the account in Exodus chapter 16, they had to prepare double portions of food to carry them over on the Sabbath because they would not find any on the Sabbath day. And so they know that day to be a day we have to prepare for because the Sabbath or the seventh day, you won't find it. And so on the Sabbath, Christ is in the tomb. He's asleep. And then early morning, um, when the women go back to look to embalm his body, he was out the tomb. And we know that to be his glorious resurrection morning, the first day of the week. And so I, I just love that. It's, it's awesome. Let's look at our third question. Has the Sabbath been lost since Jesus' time? The Jews have been scattered over the world. Wherever you find the Orthodox Jew, 
whether it be in Jerusalem or elsewhere, you would find them keeping the Seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, being observed. And it's so true. And like we just accounted about the Easter celebration, that those three days are always correctly understood by the majority of the Christian world. So I wonder why there's always a confusion. I think the nature of man is to be rebellious. And that's why we see this tendency, because even if you go back into what we read in Exodus chapter 16, what we were reading, remember that the, the children of Israel, if you go down to verse 2, this shows you the nature of man. Mm. It says here, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. But they were not murmuring against Moses, you know. And Moses clarified that. He said that they were murmuring against God. And that's where we tend to fail. Now, we have a situation where we say that time, we're trying to figure whether time has been lost. But guess what? We, are, we know through history that time has not been lost. Not only do we know through history that time has not been lost, whenever you break a rhythm pattern, everything goes off. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's say that we have a rhythm pattern of seven days. You can imagine if once you break that seven day rhythm pattern or that seven day cycle, doesn't the whole body seem to be shift out of whack? Yeah. And that's what happens. So. The cycle never changed, even though men were like to make you think so. And yes, we have discovered that we will discover later on that men cannot count. If they start taking numbers away and putting numbers in. Mm-hmm. But the weekly cycle have never been lost. And God have showed it from, from the creation, like you have read from Genesis chapter um, 2 and verses 1 to 3, mm-hmm. where you talked about the Sabbath. Then you have comes down to Exodus chapter 16. Then you have Exodus chapter 20, which highlights the Sabbath. Then it goes on to Exodus 32, and it goes on, etc. Then you come further down here, whereas in Luke chapter 23 to 24, where it shows you plainly that God, even in death, honored the Sabbath. And it goes on to show that not even his disciples said there was a change of the Sabbath. Right. So we know that the weekly cycle and time have never have been lost. Men will make you think that time has been lost by trying to alter and find other ways around it. But even when they do that, they find that their body has become out of sight, out of whack, for lack of better words. So let us look now at our fourth question. How many changes of the calendar have taken place between Christ's time and ours? It is a common belief that there were many changes, but this is not historically true. As you said, just alluded to, Brother Garland, there has been the change from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian. Not all countries made the change at the same time. Catholic countries changed in 1582. Each time and amount of time had to be corrected, but no change made ever affected the days of the month. The Julian calendar came into use in the days of Julius Caesar, about 46 BC. The seventh month Julius named after himself and is still known as July. And that is true. And um, Augustus Caesar, when he took reign, he actually wanted to be better than um, Julius. So he actually took August, which that's where you get August from Augustus Caesar. What you see there happening between Julius Caesar and Augustus and all of them, etc., is that everybody want to leave some imprint that they can have a, um, a memorial of themselves, where they glorify themselves. And that also tells you another factor about the about the human nature of man. Man trying to be God, so they want to be worshipped, so they want to can make this legacy of their name imprint in time. So they can be worshipped or remembered, that they will not be forgotten. So all this is just a play of them trying to be um, immortalized in history. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's look at our fifth question. Why was the change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar necessary and when was it made? 
The Julian calendar assumes the length of the solar year to be 365 and a quarter days, whereas it is 11 minutes and a few seconds less. This annual error accumulated as years rolled on. Some proposals, such as that of Stoffler in 1518 and and Stoffler was a mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, so he was um, studying these things. And of Pythetus of Verona in 1537 were made to rectify the error, but the matter was not taken up in earnest until 1577 by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. As in 1582, the vernal equinox or spring equinox occurred at a date March 11, 10 days earlier than it did at the time of the Council of Nice, or some people say Nice, in 325 AD. Gregory published a bull dated March 1st, or March 1, 1582, was to be reckoned the 5th of October, 1582 was to be reckoned the 15th of October, in order that also the displacement might not occur. It was further ordained that three of the leap years which occur in 400 years should be considered common years. The three leap years selected to be reduced to common years were those which close the century, example, which end in 00, zero and are not divisible by 400. Thus, 1600 was a leap year. 1700, 1800, 1900 were common years. 2000, the 2000 year, would be a leap year, and so on. This method of adjusting the days to the year is called the Gregorian calendar, or the new style. You'll find this in Standard Encyclopedia of the World's Knowledge, Volume 5, Article Calendar, page 360. We leave the reference to that in the reading. And like you said, you know, all these things happen because men, they want to leave uh, some kind of footprint or imprint in history and a memorial of the greatness of their reign or sovereignty. And they think to tamper with that which God had ordained and ordered. But, you know, all of this shifting and shuffling and adding and subtracting, it didn't mess with the cycle of time. It did not mess with the, the time recognized we have it today. Um, we have seven days a week and that hasn't changed. That doesn't change, irregardless of what happens. And uh, we, as we go into the study, you will see it play out. Question number six, did the calendar change disturb the Sabbath? It is to be noted that in the Christian period, the order of days of the week has never been interrupted. Thus, when Gregory XIII reformed the calendar in 1582, Thursday, the 4th of October, was followed by Friday, the 15th of October. So in England, in 1752, Wednesday, the 2nd of September, was followed by Thursday, the 14th of September. The Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 3, Article, Chronology, page 740. I hope you caught that. Even though they try to um, take away some days, and you will find that in 1582, Thursday the 4th of October went to Friday the 15th of October. So notice, even though they deducted 10 days, right and from the fourth they jumped to the 15th notice the days didn't change the thursday came before friday and i, and I hope we're catching that thursday came before friday so it, it doesn't change or alter the cycle of the sabbath and i think that's important in fact in most countries around the world the seventh day still has embedded in it the word sabbath like for those who speak Spanish, well, when the seven day rolls around, they sell uh, Sabado. That's the Spanish word for saying the seventh day of the week. 
I think one of the highlights we want to bring back to them is the fact that you will see um, you see the numbers one to four, then get fifteen to thirty-two. These days or number days, I like to call them number days. I would cut out like ten different ten numbers. But if you notice, if you, like you said, you point up to the top of the calendar, you notice that one, two, three, four, five, six never change. They might have give it a new name that to just help you um, be the um, lost focus of what the name, the number are called, like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So they could give it to their own gods or their pagan gods, but. If you look at it, calendar, you still say it's this one for Sunday, two for Monday, three for Tuesday, four for Wednesday, Thursday is five, and six is Friday, and of course Saturday is the seventh. So men know that God's day did not change, or His weekly cycle did not change. History have proven, and studies, scientific studies have proven, and I should have had that note with me. That when you try to do away with the weekly cycle, it affects your body function. Just doing seven day completely working and no rest affects your body function. I'm just trying to highlight the fact that even so, we have to God have made us recognize the seven day. Why? Because it's a special day, and not only that, it's a memorial. Of His creation, remember God worked on the first day. God worked on the second day. God worked on the third, the fourth, fifth, and straight to the sixth. Was the reason because God was teaching us something. And he also was teaching how to what be organized and to be balanced. Now, when the seventh day came, He wanted us to reflect and rest. But that goes to show you that the whole even. The weekly cycle is tied into man's natural existence, and that's what the, the point I'm really trying to bring out here. The weekly cycle is tied with it, your existence. So imagine, take away the weekly cycle, and what will become of man? They had some meetings a few weeks ago, the COP26 or the COP26, and they're trying to figure out how can we get. The world on a balance. How can we get order? How can we、um, bring harmony、um, between the earth and humanity? And you know, you don't have to reinvent this wheel. It's already been given. The problem is that, as you alluded to in Exodus chapter sixteen, and I want to read that. I want to read that again. In fact, I want to pull that up on the screen. It tells us that we have a problem obeying that which God had given. And I want to highlight that. Okay, I'll take it from verse 26. It says, "Six days ye shall gather it, talking about the manna, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none." So on the sixth day, gather twice as much because they have been instructed that you won't find any on the seventh day, known as the Sabbath. Verse 27 says, "And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day." Fall together, and they found none. So they just actually broke a command. They broke. They broke. A, thus said the Lord, not thus said Moses. Moses was the mouthpiece for God because remember, God wants to tabernacle with all of us. And as you go to、um, Exodus chapter twenty, rather than the entire camp go up to meet God, they sent a representative of them in Moses. Because they were afraid of the thundering and lightnings that was going on at the mount. So here now, these people on the seventh day went out against what God had told them to look for manna, which they already knew they weren't going to find, and looked at the response from God. And verse twenty-eight says, "And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep?" My commandments and my laws. He didn't say Moses' laws. He claimed them he, again. And this is why we have such chaos down here. If the Sabbath was given for man, that we can tabernacle with God and set aside from our daily labors, 
and to get to know our Creator more, get to know one another more. As we love and share Christ, we love others. And this is what the Sabbath is all about, my friends. It's a beautiful holiday that comes four times in a month, each week. And yet, it's like we don't understand, you know, if 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 the Sabbath is blessed and we rest, we receive a blessing and others are blessed. So the just the opposite must be true. If we break the Sabbath, then it's a curse upon us and humanity suffers. I wonder if there's any connection to all of this when it comes to storms and weather patterns and, and crime and chaos in the homes. Are we missing this social gathering that was called mm -hmm. for by the mouth of God every single week of each month? But there's something interesting that's going to happen this particular month. And I hope that, um, um, well, you know, I, I'm just going to mention it because I don't know if we're going to have another um, ep um, episode to go into it. But this particular month, this December 2021, December 25th just happens to fall on the Sabbath day. Yep. Isn't that interesting? And yet people say, <laughs> well, how everybody's going to keep the Sabbath? Well, everybody's going to find time to keep the Christmas. Who's going to be at work? Hmm? You know, we know that the laws of the land are trying to push some agendas around the world that you can't gather with your families and your loved ones because of this thing going around the world. But at the end of the day, the principle is in it because on Christmas holidays, we tend to just gather with our families. No one is at work. Well, most no one, because some people are trying to make that, that money, that Christmas money. People want to spend money, but at, and people try to sell it to provide for their families. So there may be one or two out there, like we see on the Sabbath, trying to find man up, right? On the time when you should be home. But at the end of the day, the principle is spend time with your family. And yet, this comes at the end of the year. You are at a disadvantage because Christ gives you the Sabbath rest four times a month. And yet, most of us are out working or or doing our own pleasure, finding our own entertainment and whatever else. You know, it, it's, just an awesome, it's just an awesome coincidence that Christmas is on the Sabbath again. Yes. I remember yes. this before. Right, God. I, I want to add a little something right there because I, I'm glad you brought up COP26 because I was going to let it pass. But I want to, you know, as we look at the earth and we look at the weekly cycle, what did God say to the children of Israel? Because you have sinned, he will remove you from the land. Mm. And we have sinned, and we will remove land. And, and listen to this, what God said here. God says that even in the morning was the sixth day. You go down to the bottom of it, it says here in verse 31 of verse 1. It says, and God saw that everything that he has made, and behold, it was what? Very good. And the evening in the morning was the sixth day so the weekly cycle was keep going and you know and every time god talked he said the evening in the morning was the first day the evening in the morning was the second day the evening in the morning was the third day mm -hmm. and it was good he always said it was good but when he came to the sixth day he said it was very good now why did i go on and brought that up i brought it up because god said while he was creating the earth it was good and every day was good mm -hmm. he gone down to the sixth day and said it was very good. And then guess what? He did not stop there. He gone to the seventh day and you read it. And it says he blessed it, sanctified, and he hollowed it. So guess what? The weekly cycle was complete in the seventh day. Amen. So guess what happened after that? You go right back to the first day and goes right back to the seventh day. Because God have ended his work and he blessed and hollowed it. And he completed his work on the seventh day. Oh, Everything I, was done. I want I want you to answer this question. I sent you brought it up. At the end of the seventh day, God blessed, blessed, and sanctified it. What other day did he did that to? None. Hmm. None. 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 Because it's good. And, we, and we do all know what the number seven means. Perfection. Seven means perfection. So complete. it was perfected. It was complete. So guess what? The earth didn't have no what? Climate problems. No. So we didn't need a climate change. <laughs> no. 
I, I had to go there. I couldn't let that just pass. So we did not need a climate change because now we want to find out that we come around and now we talk about and people don't we tend to overlook this point. These, these guys are fighting against God. They just like the people of Israel in verse in chapter 16 murmuring against God because God said this in Matthew 24 God said this to us and we tend to miss this point God says what the man down in Matthew chapter 24 I'm going to look right here at verse 4 it says and Jesus answered and said unto them take heed that no man what deceive you we are being deceived because they say all these earthquakes and things are happening because of what climate change but look what God says down here God says that for in verse 7, for the nation shall rise against nation and the kingdom shall against kingdom and there shall be what famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. Mm-hmm. But you say there's climate change, but God says it's beginning of sorrow. Why is it beginning of sorrow? Because you murmur against God and you sin and you want to break God's commandments. Go further on. Revelation come back right here in Revelation chapter 7. And it's under the sixth seal. And God says it again. This, and, there, and the stars of heaven will, will fell unto the earth. And their fig trees shall untimely fix. And, there sh- and when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And it says, and it talks about earthquakes as well. That there shall be earthquakes. You have to understand that. The earthquake or the climate problem that we are now facing is what? Because the world is coming to an end. Mm. And if you want to be like Noah on the flood and say, God, oh no, God is not going to destroy the earth. Oh no, God is not going to let the world come to an end. It's a climate change. It's a climate problem. My brothers and sisters, let me let you know right now. It's no such thing as a climate change. What we are now facing, or what we are now coming with, is the close of Earth's history. It is coming. And you can try to fight against it as much as you want. God said, if you rebel, just like the children of Israel, He will make the Earth, make the land desolate. And the land will keep it sapper because when you are not there. I hear what you're saying, but I want to kind of almost segue into the climate change the climate is changing but why it's changing but why what's bringing the change is it the earth itself let's read from isaiah 24 and i'm going to read from verse 4. it's going to be interesting that we we tied in rebellion and destruction rebellion comes then destruction right watch this the earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they, not it, they, not it, not it, the earth, they, the people, the haughty people of the earth, It says, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, and I just want to highlight the fact that he didn't say Jews. Therefore, hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Now, I get tired of few men left. With a passage that's found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, that says, Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It just it's, it's amazing to see that there's nothing new. The reason why we're seeing what we're seeing is because we want to change God's laws, his ordinance, his principles. We can't. Like Brother Colin say, when you go against that, sudden destruction is gonna happen. You know, do you know the Bible says that if you're breaking God's law, even your prayer is an abomination? Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9. It's a serious thing. In fact, let me let you see it. I'm going to share my screen. I want you to see that text. I don't want you to take my word. I don't want you to see it with your own eyes. In fact, if you don't have your Bible, write it down and study for yourself. 
he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. That's deep. That's serious. That's right there with same-sex marriages. That's right up there with, with witchcraft. That's right up there with eating abominable things. It's right there. Disregarding God's law. Turning your ear from hearing the law. By the way, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you turn your ear, you don't want to hear God's word. God spoke these words. Exodus chapter 20 verses 2 to 17. God tells us that the Sabbath is his day. Exodus chapter 16. We just saw why. Because in Genesis chapter 2, he created the earth, created us. We belong to him. So he sets an order what he wants us to follow. But like we saw in Exodus chapter 16, party people have their own way. They want to do their own thing, regardless of the law that was put in place. My friend, this is the serious thing that we are facing, and it lies squarely with us. It starts with us. We have to obey God's law. I mean, we don't Amen. have to, but like um, Joshua 24 verse 15 says, Choose ye this day who you going to serve. But as for me and my house, we can take God's commandments. Not be, to be saved, mind you. But because we are saved it's like when you get married mm -hmm. when you get married you know you're not forced to love the person whom you marry i hope i hope you know there's something called a shotgun, <laughs> shotgun wedding you know sometimes you you at yeah, gunpoint got to do certain things because of what you have done before but nonetheless when you love your their spouse you want to do any and all things for them especially before you get married because you know the 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 boyfriend girlfriend thing you want to make sure that that person is so taken care of that they don't go nowhere else because you love them you want to do you want to pour out all that you that you have for them to show the love that exists in you for them when we love christ as he said as jesus says in john chapter in fact i'm going to pull it up again i don't want you to take my word i want you to see what jesus says you love jesus here's what he says this is how you should love them in John chapter 14, in verse 15, here's what it says. He says, if, if, conditionary, if ye love me, keep my, command. my commandments. Amen. In conclusion, the week in use at the time of Christ is exactly the same as the week of our calendar today. Sunday is the first day of the week and Saturday is the seventh day. Jesus lived under the Roman calendar. What the Jews call seventh day and first day, the Romans call Saturn's day and Sun's day. And we're going to highlight that in our next study as we look at proper Sabbath observance. But my friends, this has been a beautiful study and it reminds me of the greatest love for me to give me a date that he had set that we can come and have an apple with him. Friends, let us not miss that engagement. Let us not miss that date. It comes every week that you're alive, that is. But I pray that you go back and look up these things because Christ had set a date for us that we could spend time with him. This is what Jesus had done. This is what our Lord has done from the creation of time. He's given us a date. Don't miss out on it. This has been a blast. Um, we're going to say a prayer to close out this study, Brother Colin. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the word. We thank you for what has been said today. You know, many people have not been aware of the challenges of what we are facing in this world. But we do know one thing. If you keep God's commandments, God will bless us. Let us be faithful to hear his word, to take it with us that we may abide with him and to keep his will, that we be obedient to his Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you for tuning in and taking the time to listen to this broadcast today. We pray and hope that it encourages you to search these things for yourselves. Friends, it is sweet to trust and obey the laws of God. For myself, for the Edie, and for Brother Colin, we say, join us for our next study. We already told you what's going to be. God's willing, Maranatha. <laughs>